go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome everyone. Great to have you here this morning. Uh, thanks for uh, for taking just a little break from the warmth and sunshine to come inside and join us for our service. I know it, it's real tempting out there today, but we're glad you're here. Uh, we're also glad for those, those among us who are streaming today. Always great to have you as well. So welcome to one and all. We're grateful for all that you come with, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences all that helps make you who you are. I say that every Sunday, and uh, I, I'm, I'm never saying it just out of habit. Think about how important it is to come to a church where someone says, welcome because of all you bring with you. Your lifestyle, your beliefs, your experiences, your choices, your differences. That's what we're about as Unitarian Universalists. So welcome to one and all. Before you greet one another, I do want to make one announcement on behalf of our Board of Trustees. And that is that our uh, members of the Board of Trustees at least will be in our Friendship Hall after the service uh, to take your comments and feedback on the proposed bylaw revisions. This is something for those who don't know, our board has been working on for well over a year now and have been getting together every Monday night for a couple of hours to work on these for a very long time. So uh, please give them any thoughts or feedback you might have. And then uh, for those uh, who are not here in person and others who uh, might want to participate, you would have received a link on the UUCS, the church email, effectively, that goes out every week with a link for a meeting tonight uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. or this afternoon, as it says here. So it's according to what time of year it is in Spokane. I'm still getting used to the longer days, but 5 or 6 p.m. this afternoon, a Zoom meeting to also uh, uh, talk back about uh, talk with the board and ask questions and whatnot, get clarification around uh, bylaw changes. So you should be able to find that link in your email. Okay, yeah, let's take a few minutes to greet one another. And uh, if you are at home, I, I told the, if you just, just give me one more second here if you don't mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Because I, I, I know that, uh, you know, we have a wonderful streaming service, but unlike congregations that are meeting on Zoom, which has its drawbacks, uh, there, there's not really any way to interact with each other. So first of all, remember that you're not alone. There's a lot of other folks streaming with you. But we are working on uh, trying to put some systems together that will enable you to engage a bit uh, as well. So. Uh, bear with us. But for now, if you want to greet, uh, greet someone with a text or a quick, quick phone call or something like that, please do. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I do hope you'll stay around after our service for social hour where you can visit a bit more. But let's move forward now by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need and may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Here are a few words I wrote some time ago for the Old Little Nature Chapel. One of the privileges of advanced age is the ability to draw on experience to go beyond the individual incidents of life and see the big picture. As we travel through this stage of existence, we may feel joy enhanced by your unique significance or sadness tempered by knowledge and understanding. As we go through life's eternal cycles, we may draw hope from our growing comprehension of our unity with all there is, for we are one with humankind, the animal kingdom, all of nature. Namaste. And you may recognize these marvelous thoughts penned in a letter by Albert Camus. 
My dear, in the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy. For it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there is something stronger, something better, pushing right back. Truly yours, Albert Camus. Well, our first in-service hymn of the morning is Touch the Earth and Reach the Sky, number 301. And people have been telling me that if they are in the back, it might be a little hard to access the screen. So this one is in your gray hymnal, 301. The rest of us that can see the screen, the words will be there. Please rise as you're willing and able. going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds. Uh, I did not have any specific requests this week, but during this time I think it's appropriate that we include a candle each week on behalf of those in the Ukraine and in Russia and Poland and all those parts of the world that are most impacted by the violence that's going on there. Let's do take a moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of, and as always, you're welcome to name them aloud if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. Don't wait on me, please. <laughs> oh, we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering. 
<laughs> which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. Tom, thank you for your patience. <laughs>
21st near Cannon Hill Park. My neighbor Stephanie can look across the street from where she lives and see that house today. Now Harper Joy lived in a very unusual neighborhood there on the South Hill. In fact, it made Ripley's Believe It or Not in 1928. On one corner, we had the Joy family. Across the street was the Sad family. <laughs> I've got a pair of shoes being repaired by the Sad Shoe Repair. Next door was the John Happy family. <laughs> and I played tennis with John Happy, who grew up in that house. And right across the street was the Gay family. <laughs> we had a diverse neighborhood back then. <laughs> Through the 1920s, Harper was active in the Spokane Theater eventually becoming the face and voice that launched the Spokane Civic Theater. He produced a silent movie called Crown Jewels, and that starred many local actors. You can go to the Mac. You can go to the Mac today and ask to see Crown Jewels, and they might show it to you. Now, everything was going well for Harper Joy, but something bad happened in 1929. Does anybody know what bad thing happened in 1929? Take a guess. What happened? 1929. Well, it led to a war. What? Thinks he might have died. The Great Depression happened, and all the banks failed. Now remember, Harper was working for a bank, but he didn't lose his job. He did have a little extra time on his hands, and he was now grown up. So, why not join a circus? Harper joined the Al Barn Circus as a clown toured all up and down the West Coast. Then he joined the Shell Brothers Circus, finally made it to the Ringling Brothers Circus, toured far and wide. He was even made president of the Circus Fans of America. If you grow up and become a clown, you think you ought to quit your day job? <laughs> Probably not. Harper's clowning around caught the attention of Louis Davenport, who was so taken with Harper's love of the circus, he decided to honor Harper with a room now known as the Circus Room. You can go down to the Davenport and book room 730 and be surrounded by a tapestry of clowns and elephants and lions tigers all night long. Did you know a circus clown could drive a train? <laughs> all aboard the Cannon Hill and Pacific Railroad departing 825 West 21st for Joytown. Get your tickets here. On December 25th, 1936, the kids of Cannon Hill awoke to a surprise in the Joy's backyard. A real train on a real track had appeared called the Cannon Hill and Pacific Railroad. For the next 20 years, it would magically carry kids to places like Joysburg, Joys Town, St. Joy. Now Harper had a lot of connections, including railroad, and he had found this old saddleback locomotive for sale and arranged to have it, a caboose, 
and 60 feet of track trucked to his backyard. The railroad slogan was the road to yesterday. Our road not as long, but as wide as any. Harper would stand there in uniform, collect the tickets, which were free, and make sure all the kids knew the rules of the rail. Train runs only during periods of total eclipses, tidal waves, and days when security dealers are happy and contented. <laughs> Passengers over 87, accompanied by their parents, are permitted to ride half fare. <laughs> Harper even posted a timetable showing the schedule. Well, speaking of time, I think mine's about up. But in Doris's final chapter, called The Final Curtain, she writes that although Harper Joy certainly gave so much, he may have been the recipient of the greatest gift of all, that of being able to make people laugh. Let's sing the kids to their class, and maybe we can make somebody laugh today. Thanks for the help. meditate on these inspirational words written by Rachel Carson. There is symbolic as well as actual beauty in the migration of the birds, the ebb and flow of the tides, the folded bud ready for the spring. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature. The assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after the winter, creating a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life and be a source of strength. It was a wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful story. I'm glad I got to hear it twice this morning. <clears throat> it brought back a lot of memories. I also wanted to grow up and be a circus clown. <laughs> Ended up in ministry. <clears throat> so my wish came true. <laughs> I'm going to read... Uh, just a couple of paragraphs from uh, the introduction, actually, to the first two paragraphs of, of my book, Evolution's Way. Uh, I, I've written some other books in the last couple of years, two, two other books, <laughs> that get a lot more attention. Uh, and, and I'm happy to uh, continue that struggle, because that's where I'm at right now. But if I, if I could just focus on uh, something else, I would focus on the ideas in this book because this is what makes me happy and what excites me and makes me have hope for our future. So here's the first two paragraphs of Evolution's Way. 
By the way, the subtitle is uh, Toward Exponentially Higher States of Complexity, Consciousness, and Unity. So this book is not a scientific treatise, and I am not a scientist. I'm a clown. No, I don't say that part. <laughs> I'm a minister, and it's based on a collection of sermons I've given over the course of 15 years beginning in 2004. They're founded on my understanding of evolution as the exponential flow of everything. Life, ideas, society, technology, humanity, and the entire cosmos towards increasingly higher states of complexity, consciousness, and unity in that order. Each touch upon a recurring theme in my pulpit, that the universe itself is awakening, and Homo sapiens represent a significant bifurcation in this evolutionary process. This is so largely because human beings, to a much greater degree than any other animal on Earth, have developed the ability to exchange information through the sharing of ideas freeing it from its genetic confines. This book, like any book, is a good example. Information can now be exchanged between host organisms in the forms, form of memes as well as genes. Human technology is also evolving exponentially to facilitate this obvious trajectory. I need only mention computers and the internet to prove the point. Advances now underway in robotics, extended reality, and artificial intelligence are also on the verge of expanding human intelligence and intelligence itself in the coming years, much sooner, I think, than most imagine. As we increasingly converge with such technology, our species, like 99% of all species to have come before us, will go extinct, likely by evolving into something else. I predict the human part of us will remain within whatever we become, just as our single-celled ancestors remain part of us. Human technology, from the Greek word meaning art or craft, is an extension of our humanity. So there's already something human in all of it. Mora. Today's service is a little different than usual. I did not prepare a sermon, so I'll see you later. No. This is actually what we call Conversations with Todd, which is an opportunity for a few folks, because I'm long-winded, so a few folks to ask us some questions, uh, maybe about things that you've heard me say before and have been wondering about or things you've not heard me talk about before and have been wondering about. The only real limitation is, is I don't want to uh, talk about church business. This is, an, a business, is not a business meeting. It's a, it's a uh, service, so I won't talk about any church business. Uh, and to start with, we had one of our uh, online attendees send me a very nice email, uh, Jim Marsh. 
uh, with a couple of questions. Uh, and, and again, we're working on getting the sort of engagement happening two-way for some of our online folks. But for right now, I appreciated the email with a couple of really thoughtful questions. The, the, the first one is, how can the congregation or I as an individual best support Dr. Eckloff and UUCS leadership at this time? And Jim, I, I would just you know, answer by thanking you so much for the question because uh, it makes me feel better just, just uh, having somebody express such care and compassion and concern. And that's probably the best thing that, that people can do to support each other right now is uh, to let us know that we're not alone. Uh, no matter what it is we might be dealing with in our lives, uh, whether it's you know, uh, pushing back against uh, what we consider authoritarian forces in our world, in our religion, or, or trying to cope with uh, the isolation, the damage from the isolation we felt in many ways, uh, or really, you know, even, even streaming, uh, so many of you are streaming, but you, you are disconnected from each other. You don't realize that there's a whole crowd of folks that are, that are online with us and lots of folks in the room that are with you as well. So uh, exper expressing those sentiments of what can we do to support you is probably one of the most pastoral kind things that somebody can ask. So I thank you for the question. The other question uh, is, what question or questions does Dr. Eckloff wish the congregation to ask? <laughs> and I've actually planted those, so no. No, I have not. Uh, you know, the, the, the way I look at it is I get to answer the question I want to answer almost every Sunday, right? whether you've asked me or not. So. That's uh, usually, usually my sermons are me, you know, uh, about my process uh, of discovery. Something I've been wondering about and then kind of sharing that with you. So, so this time is really for those of you who uh, might have some specific questions to ask me that I might be able to respond to. So uh, I, I, I will leave the questioning to you today. Yes, Don. Uh Going along with your evolution book and what have you, mm -hmm. of course things evolve and some die out because they can't change or they change in their own direction. And uh, there are dissonance groups within the UU field. One, I'd like for you to give a sermon sometimes summarizing the dissident groups, if you could. The other is, uh, we're going to evolve one way or the other in this religion. Uh, do you have any prognosis for whether we're going to evolve and die out, or we're going to evolve and become better and meet the new challenges? Okay, so let me paraphrase the question for those of you who, who, haven't, who, who haven't heard it, for those of you who are streaming with us and maybe sitting in the back. Uh, Don's saying in, in in line with the idea of evolution, that uh, we are going to evolve, we're evolving as a, as a religion, as well as as a congregation. And uh, if, if, if one, sometimes things that evolve uh, die off, you know, uh, in the process of evolution. So that's, that's a possibility for a lot of institutions as well, including our own. And we are, as an institution, going through some uh, radical issues right now and if we don't uh, evolve we may uh, we may die, die out we may bifurcate into different species if you will uh, if there's a split in the religion and then finally Don asked me uh, you know if I have any any predictions uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you what I hope will, will happen with our with with Unitarian Universalism my hope is that we will remain Unitarian Universalist and that we will, we will continue to have a Unitarian Universalist Association of which our congregations are part of. Oh, thank you, Tom. Tom has a microphone. That might help. Uh, that's my hope. So, so that means that, that we're going we're gonna to work through our differences. Now, the differences as I see them uh, are twofold. 
there, there's an ideological difference over how we should be dealing with uh, certain social issues, particularly racial justice in our world. It, it's not really, that's not really what the conflict is about though. Uh, all of us have the same goals. You know, my, my belief about approach, my approach to racial, racial justice uh, should, should emphasize our common humanity. That's how, that's how all justice is achieved, in my opinion, by widening the circle, right? Becoming more and more inclusive and recognizing ourselves in those we thought we, thought we were different, with, different from. Critical race theory, in my opinion, is, is an approach that divides the human family. It segregates us into identities, tells us that we can't possibly relate to each other because we're so different from each other, uh, corners us into what they call caucusing based upon all of those identities that for, for, for all of our existence as Unitarians, we were, we've been saying shouldn't matter. And now all of a sudden they, they matter to the point where, where you can't even play, you know, it's inappropriate for a white person to play jazz music because that's a misappropriation, right? This is the kind of stuff that, that's going on. So uh, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. But I don't want to purge Unitarian Universalism of critical race theory or those individuals who think that's the way to go. Because we have very similar goals, right? We, we all want to make the world better by making it less racist among other types of oppression, less oppressive. But the problem is, is that the UUA leadership in its current incarnation is not willing to have any dissenting voices. This has become dogma. And that is what I am against. My books are not about critical race theory. I don't mention critical race theory in my books. I talk about the inability of us to talk to each other without, without being canceled by the new church authorities. That's my problem. That is illiberal and it is ununitarian. So we need to, if we're going to save the religion, we have to get back to this. And I think we can do that politically. And what I would say is, my, my final comment is, my hope is in the fact that I see and hear from Unitarians around the country every day who are discovering what's going on and discovering uh, my books in their own search for trying to figure out how to explain this weird thing that's going on in their congregations that they suddenly don't recognize. And my books continue to sell one or two copies or more just about every day. And they have for over three, or well, going on three years now, whatever it's been. Which tells me, because it is such a niche market, right? This is, these are Unitarians, I would assume, who are buying these books. Because who else would want to read them? <laughs> And so that means people are continuing to take interest in it, and it's growing. And I have hope in the growth of that dissension. The more people who become aware, particularly people in the pews, right? It may be that the ministers uh, and, and, and some of the leadership is, is buying into this and trying to push this on their congregations. But when ordinary Unitarians, I mean, the reason that you guys are in this church is because you believe in freedom and you believe in open conversation, and you believe in dissent, and you believe in respecting each other, and you believe in finding a way to work together and make things better despite our differences. That's what we're about. And that's what Unitarians are about in congregations everywhere. So as they start to be able to frame what's going on, they want, they want to do something about it. So my hope is we're getting there, slowly but surely. Yes. Okay, we've got one over here. Tom's going to bring you the microphone, Dave. That way I won't have to poorly paraphrase your question. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I'm using the word acceptance. It's, it's just sort of boiling it down to an acceptance of people, um, no matter who they are. I'm wondering about this division that's, that's obviously um, uh, of becoming stronger. And... We have a national convention coming up in Portland coming up soon. Do you think there'll be any discussion of that in that process? Uh, no, I, I don't think that the, the uh, officials at the UUA will have any discussion of this conflict. 
This is an organization that got rid of the letters to the editor of their national magazine because they got so many complaints and so many letters of cri criticizing them that rather than be so obviously biased by only showing positive letters, they just cut them all out, right? Uh, no, they're not willing to talk about this. They, they, they're still in, the, in the, the demonizing others phase, right? Anybody who disagrees is racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, classist, kitchen sink, right? So anything they can throw at you. So I don't, I don't think they will, but I do think there, there will be more, uh, there will be open demonstrations at the Portland General Assembly for the, fir for the first time. Yeah. I noticed that one of uh, your upcoming sermons is entitled, Idolatry of Emotions, Objectifying mm -hmm. Our Own Subjective Experiences. Please forgive me for reading this because I needed to put it on paper. Okay, so it says, how often we project our subjective emotional experiences onto the world, trying to make empirical reality justify our personal feelings and desires as if they represent objective truth. Now, I understand that we shouldn't say things are just because we want them to be. However, I'm wondering if you hear from people like me, would you add more sermons that speak to the heart rather than the brain? Emotions are part of who we are, and I think they are a valuable part. I would like to hear of experiences that affected you emotionally. What were they? How do they relate to the experiences of others? And how does that increase your connection to others? Can we see more of that in the future? Well, I appreciate that, Linda. And, and uh, I, I would want to suggest that I, I uh, am an emotional being who expresses my emotions fairly frequently in my sermons. So, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't come across that way, but, but uh, I think I do. And, and I also uh, am not one who believes that somebody who is logical or intelligent is automatically uh, irrational or, or unemotional. Uh, I think those two things go hand in hand. And I certainly think that's true of myself. Uh, as far as my sermons go, uh, I, I uh, unfortunately do have uh, folks over the years who don't care for my style. And I can understand that, but I'm not somebody who lets that bother me nor uh, sway me because I am the speaker and the preacher that I am and that's, that's who I'm going to be. So I, I'm not somebody who can give sermons uh, that everybody, that appeal to everybody. I don't expect to. As soon as I start to try to adjust so that I appeal to somebody, you know, uh, in a way that is awkward for me to do to begin with, because it's not who I am, then I'm going to have somebody else come and say, oh, I, I uh, really didn't care for your sermon. You know, you've had a change or whatever it might be. Uh, we're, we're a crowd of a lot of different people, and so part of the reason I was called to this church is because of my sermonizing, because of uh, the, way, the way that I sermonize and the, the work that I put into them, the subjects that I cover, the passion that I have for the subjects that I cover, that sort of thing. So part of my preaching is, my, is fundamental to who I am as a being, right? It's, I'm not, this is not performances for me. It's not something that... I can just sort of say, well, you know, what, what style do I want to do today? What subjects do I want to do today? What, you know, how do I want to present myself today? I say, what do I want to talk about today? And I talk about it as Todd Eckloff would talk about it because that's the only way I can express myself. So that's probably not the answer that you wanted, but that's, that's the best I can give, to, to be as, as honest as, as you were with me. And I thank you for that. Okay. Got one over here, Tom? Uh, the, the turmoil's going on with, inside the church. Put, put it up just a little bit closer. There you go. All right. The, the turmoil's going on inside the church, which, what you're talking about. There, there's similar turmoil's going on kind of in all 
areas of our society, and nationally and internationally. And, and I, I just want, what, it just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why that is. I don't know why. Oh, oh, a wonderful question. I actually am glad you asked that. I was one of the plants. Yeah, you're one of the plants. <laughs> Check is in the mail. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the phenomenon that is impacting the Unitarian Universalist Association is one that is in, impacting particularly progressive organizations all over the all over the West, Western culture, not not just even in the United States, but other places as well. And it is unfortunate because it it is a, a type of extremism on the left that, like extremism on the right, is is based on a, an extreme intolerance of anybody who disagrees. And and it, it's. One of the reasons it's unfortunate is because the, our, our, the critics of liberalism at all who are on the right use this as an excuse to now, you know, sort of blanket liberals everywhere with this sort of intolerant mindset. And it's not. It, it's, a, it, it's an appendage that has affixed itself to liberalism. And it manifests, uh, you know, so, and there's still different names for it, right? But, we still haven't settled on what we're even going to call it. Some people call it wokeness. Some people call it cancel culture. Uh, some people call it identitarianism, uh, political correctness. Uh, John McWhorter, you know, he's just come out with a new book, calls it woke racism. So we're still trying to even wrap our heads around what are we going to, what are we going to label this, this I ideology that's impacting us. So it's really, it, it really is uh, something scary because what happens when liberalism becomes extreme is it, sacrifice, it wants to sacrifice freedom in order to create equality. And, and that, that deprives the need of human beings to, to fully unfold uh, so that we can just simply have a roof over our heads and food to eat and those sort of things, which by the way, they've not done such a good job of providing those things either in, in their plans for the just distribution of wealth. So, it's scary if this mindset should take hold. What, what we might even look back on, I hope, as a, a new type of secular religion. But what's happening? What's happening? Let's, let's try to look at why this phenomenon is going on. And I, I've likened, I, I liken it to uh, being in a, in a room full of conversations. And you can't hear, you can't understand anything that's being said, right? Because there's all this buzz. This is a room, for example, when you're in the fellowship area back there and everybody's talking, when you just walk in, it's just a, 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 a lot of noise, right? So I think what, what, what has happened is, is uh, communication and information has been democratized through the exponential advancement of technologies. Right from from initially we were we were lighting uh, you know fires and towers to say hey you know somebody's coming, and, and then you know we ended up with the telegraph, uh, and, and and the world started to become wired. Right, we started to to make a a very rudimentary global brain. Right, with synaptic network networks, and and it was a big deal when the. The, the impossible was done where we ran an underwater cable from the United States to England and the Queen of England was able to talk with or communicate through the telegraph to the president, right? That was huge. Well, think about the exponential advancement since then. Now we have uh, instant communication, social media, every, you know, everybody's, everybody's a publisher. Everybody's a TV star, right? All you have to do is express yourself and it's there. And we've had the democratization of communication. Problem is, we're all speaking at once. And we're all saying different things. And it's frightening because we're creatures who want certainty in our lives. And we can't stand all the noise. We want it to settle down. It's like the world is vibrating at such a rate that it's, it only can cause us to become anxious. So what do you do when you go into a room and you hear all of this noise and you want to make some sense of things. 
Right? You find one person. You find one conversation that you can become part of in here. And everything else doesn't matter. Everything else gets ignored. Everything else is being dismissed. So in order to deal with the noise of our existence, I believe that we are breaking into, into small cloistered ideas that we can focus on and ignore everything else. In fact, we feel threatened because of the, the relative calm of these echo chambers that we're in. And we become threatened by those who are outside. And so look at how this is manifesting, right? It's, it's manifesting in this woke ideology, which is based on identity, right? Let's, let's break into tribes. Let's break into identities where all we hear is the one conversation that we want to hear. It, it, you know, it, it started off before the internet hit with things like Fox News and then MSNBC, right? Because cable, the cable television was another uh, uh, exponential uh, burst from what television had been. Three channels, three choices, to all kinds of choices 24 hours a day. So you start, these, these, these programs come up and say, well, we're going to just represent one idea. And we're going to try to get all the viewers over here to, to look at our idea. And, we'll, and, we'll, and when what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll exist based on criticizing every, uh, every other idea. Right? And, and, it's, and it's so much worse today with social media because now everybody goes on and says what they want. It's like stream of consciousness out there. So to make sense of the world, we're trying to break into these, into, to, to uh, I should say, um, separate into these different identity groups, into these different echo chambers into these different tribes, into these different nations, right? Uh, that the Brexit and the election of Trump and the, the, the rise of uh, autocrats around the world is a manifestation of people trying to retreat back into isolationism. It's not going to work. It won't work. You can't do it. No, no more than the kings and priests were able to put the books back uh, you know, in the bottle once the printing press was created. So I, I see what's happening right now is the world is vibrating apart, by which I mean our reality is vibrating apart into pieces. And we're struggling in these different ways to make sense of it. Now to me, the, the, the new reality is already there, but we're still talking in terms of the old reality. And the old reality is the reality of the nation states. Right? The, old, the old reality is that we are, uh, we are, I am an American, I am a Russian, I am a Ukrainian, right? I, I am a Chinese. Uh, these, these nationalistic identities, this is how we came to identify ourselves, even though these, these really have little to do with what we are as, as human beings. That's gone. That went away. It went away at least two years ago. It's been going away for a long time, but it's really bad now because, and I shouldn't say bad, it's good, but it, it's prominent, okay? B because now we realize, oh my, we have a global communication system. I can talk with anybody in the world, not just another American who lives next door to me, right? I can, I, it's a global communication system. We have a global banking system. Look how well that, that has helped with the crisis in Russia right now. Right? We have a global, a global economy. We have, a global, we have a, a global environment. And we know that because of the environmental crisis that's impacting us everywhere, regardless of who we are. We have a global supply chain. If it gets tugged on in one place, it impacts us all. We have global pandemics. And so we have a, a new global, a new global Animal is emerging. A global civilization is emerging. That's the new reality, and we don't have the language or the systems in place to, to figure out how it's going to work. But that's what's going to emerge once, once things vibrate to pieces. And we see a little bit of this with the response the world is having to what's going on in Russia. Now, I, I've, I, there's a lot of criticism, good criticism out there, for what is going on uh, you know, for the United States posturing, right? Because the analogy to what we did just a few years ago 
in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and including causing one of the worst refugee crises since World War II, right? All, all of the same things are going on. Innocent people being killed, cities being destroyed, places being occupied. So it's, it's a fair criticism. And I think the best thing Joe Biden could do, rather than getting up and, and demonizing Putin, who certainly deserves to be criticized, but he has to start by saying, you know what? America had made these mistakes not too long ago. And I'm sorry for that. And we cannot let this happen anymore. But the world is different now. We've shared too much together. We're, we're one community now. And, 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 and to own our stuff, right? But, what, but, but nevertheless, despite the fact that he hasn't done that, this is not more of the same, what's going on. The way this, the world has come together and said, we're going to take this bully in our neighborhood, because it's a global neighborhood, and we're going to respond like it is. We're going to corner him off. And we're going to do it nonviolently. But we're going to corner him off so that he can't hurt anybody. And that's what the global sanctioning system is about. It's a global response. And to me, that is the first evidence I see of something systemic of this new world, this new global community emerging. So I find that to be very hopeful. And I probably should have wrote that down <laughs> and done it as a sermon. But <laughs> it's recorded. Okay, so maybe one more, and I'll try not to be as long-winded. Tom, did you have one? Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that... Um, we hear a lot about, more and more about, and I wonder if you have any comments about it, is uh, religion. Um, the freedom to practice a religion is used by some to say that allows me to discriminate against others. Mm -hmm. And others will say freedom of religion means that that won't happen. Do you see anything that might go toward resolving that one way or another other than legislation to mm -hmm. clarify or is that yeah. the only answer? Oh, well, you know, he, here's one of the things I like to remind, remind us what, what liberalism emphasizes. So, so you know, for, for, for instance, there have been a lot of people who have refused to wear a mask and uh, to get vaccinated, many of whom uh, have claimed that because this is for, th they, they should have the freedom to do so, right? That this is a free country, and literally they think they're, they, they, they claim that they're fighting back. I mean, these, these trucker movements where they're, uh, they, they consider themselves freedom, fight, freedom fighters, right? Uh, and People, sh I mean, certainly people should be free not to get a, to have someone stick them with a needle if they don't want to. I, I get that. And there should be, but there should also be social consequences for that. Uh, someone has a right to say, well, you can't come in my business if you're not going to be vaccinated, right? But the thing about liberalism is liberalism, remember, emerged out of the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages was a period in which people, you know, everything that was expressed had to be expressed in orthodox terms. So even the people that were bumping up against society were, were expressing it in orthodox terms. So all, the, all the art was Christian, was Christian art, for example, in, in Europe at least. Uh, all, the, all, the, all philosophy was, was an apology for uh, Christian doctrine. Uh, everything people said and thought and expressed was supposed to somehow express the language of, of the religion. And, and when the Renaissance came and there was a little bit of, you know, breaking apart of church authority and, and Renaissance is referring to the rediscovery or the, or the reawakening to the, to the uh, ancient Greek philosophers, the early philosophers who had a belief in the, in the positive view of human abilities, uh, the commitment to freedom of speech was suddenly born. Right, and it flourished during the Enlightenment. But, but that, was the, that was what freedom was about for the liberals. It was about the freedom to express yourself. 
The freedom to speak and to think and to share ideas. And that's what tolerance meant. When they fought for tolerance and argued for tolerance, it was for the tolerance of ideas. It wasn't the freedom to do whatever you want. And as a liberal, I will tell you, I do not believe that you should have the freedom to do whatever you want. Because if we take that to the logical conclusion, you could say, well, why can't I be free to murder somebody? Well, of course you can't be free to murder somebody because that infringes upon their welfare. And that is the litmus test. We cannot have behaviors in our society that infringe upon the well-being of others. And this is why the woke are actually trying to shift the idea of words as being harmful. It's the same thing that the kings and the priests did when they were trying to make the printing press illegal. Right? They started equating words with harm. But no, as liberals in general, we are talking about the, the freedom to express ourselves as individuals. But that does not mean the freedom to do whatever we want at the expense of someone else. So, yes, I think there should be laws in place and rules in place, and including religions, that say, you know, you're free to express yourselves, you're free to believe whatever you want, you're free to say whatever you want, but you are not free to do whatever you want. And if doing, you're doing something that is going to harm others, that's fine. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe in, in gay marriage, uh, or, or, or equality for gay people and you decide you don't want to serve them in your business then you can't have a business because guess who paid for those roads and that sidewalk to get to, to, to for you to place that business there right so I do not believe uh, that, that freedom means just doing whatever the hell you want and I don't I don't think those who, who fight for that are freedom fighters at all <laughs> so that, that's pretty Conservative. All right, one more, one more. Yeah, go ahead. It's been a rough three years. It's been, it's been a rough three years, yep. How oh, how am I? Uh, thank you. I, I'm doing okay, yeah. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's been different. And I, I remember when I wrote, wrote my book, uh, saying to myself, because I didn't know what the consequences would be, but I said... Uh, you know, you know what it's like. Uh, you, you're 50 whatever years old. You, you know what it's like to be loved, to be, to be loved by a lot of people. Now you may learn what it's like to be despised by a lot of people. And so I went into it with that sort of stoic attitude that this would be a, a, another experience in life, you know. And at first it was really... Uh, it was really difficult. I mean, like like fetal position, difficult for the first couple of days, you know. And then, you know, as I started to come out of that and realize, you know, this was important for me to do and more important than anything else. Uh, as a church, we dealt with a lot of conflict, and and that was really stressful for me, uh, as you can imagine. And then, uh, you know, we, we had an, an election and some folks didn't like the turnout and they, they found another way for themselves and uh, that made me feel a lot better, to be quite honest, because, I mean, I, I bless those old friends on their way, but uh, I, I don't need the, the stress in my life of being attacked for nothing. Uh, and, and then I've, I've come to a place uh, where I'm, I'm really, uh, it's really important for me to continue to push back against the Unitarian Universalist Association. Uh, and, and we as a congregation have actually become sort of a, a figurehead of that, of that movement. It's, it's one, of the, one of the reasons we have a lot of folks joining us from afar is because they're turning to this church to to see what we're doing, to hear what we have to say, and, and because as the letter expressed, some folks want to just be able to support us. So it's kind of, it, it's like a different existence, you know, it's an existence where, where I'm, I'm, I'm up against things, you know, I don't want to be up against things, I want to go with the flow of things, but this is, uh, this is the 
what life calls me to be right now. So I'm okay. I won't say I'm, hey, things are great now, you know, but it's, it's, it's important for me. I'm in an important place. And, I, and I'm, I'm good with that. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you all very much for, for uh, uh, listening today. Well, we're going to step away from the world of questions and back into the world of friendship here. Uh, we're going to do a song by Burt Bacharach. I remember hearing this one when Dionne Warwick um, recorded it, and I love that woman's voice, so it was great to do some research online and hear her sing it again, along with, in fact, some other friends like, um, uh, come on, Elton John and Stevie Wonder and Gladys Knight. So um, stand up and see if you can kind of sing along with me on That's What Friends Are For.